Hey, what's up? Welcome to another episode of What's Up Conversations, a podcast with icons of pop culture. I'm your host, Tammy Treza Nikovar, and today I have one of the most influential composers of video games. He is a BAFTA winner composer of great games such as Dead Space, Rise of the Tomb Raider, Moss, and Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 Warzone. My amazing guest is Jason Graves. In this episode, Jason and I talk about our past and how he influenced my career, his techniques writing for horror, dead space after 15 years, and a ghost story that happened to him late at night. Before we begin, please make sure to subscribe to What's Up Conversations if you're enjoying the show. What's Up Conversations is available on YouTube and all the major podcast streaming services. Thank you very much. Let's go. Hello and welcome to What's Up Conversations, Jason. It's so amazing that our paths seem to cross every now and then. This is the second time that we talk on our podcast. Uh, the previous one was, uh, I guess, almost five years ago and another podcast that I had called wow. Noisology. It was great. But let me give you the listeners of What's Up Conversations who might not know about my kind of obsession and fanboyism over Jason's great work throughout the years. And this is a... This is <laughs> this is something that going to refresh your memory as well. So uh, it's going to be kind of long. Please bear with me. <laughs> Go for so, it. I'm all yeah. ears. It goes back when I was 17 playing Dead Space. God damn, I wasn't even old to, enough for the age rate of that game. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know music for games was a thing. I was like, don't they download music on the internet from other movies and just put it on games. But when I played that game, I was horrified by music and, and sound of that game. And trust me, I was a horror movie geek back then, and I still am. But this game was something else. And I remember back then, Dead Space music was a fucking phenomenon. Everyone was talking about it. This was such a milestone in the history of video games music that I remember people were genuinely curious that, who was the composer of this game? So... It was th- about that time that I slowly started to fall in love with the idea of becoming a video game composer. From that moment, I was following your career, listening and playing whatever project you were involved with. And in 2011, I remixed a track from Dungeon Siege 3 that you worked on. And then I sent it to you, and you actually took the time to listen to it and emailed me back saying that it was great. And I remember that you wrote... Keep up the good work. And boy, oh boy, that was such a powerful, inspiring email for me. Some <laughs> some years later, back in 2018, you worked on this awesome game, Moss. And there was a beautiful single with Maluka called Home to Me. In your Twitter, I guess, you uh, started a rem- remix competition. And I said, hey, uh, for old time's sake, let's do another remix after some years of learning. So let's see how it goes. And I did it, and I won the competition. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Then, then we had a video call, and it was a dream come true for me to speak to you. So now it's 2023, almost 15 years from the moment when I said, what the fuck, there are video game composers? And my good sir, I listened to you. I kept up the good work. I'm a full video game composer now. I make a living out of it, and my music kicks ass now. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> and that's the end of the podcast, right? Because how can you get more like cool and upbeat and like inspirational than that? I I love, I love that story. Yeah. Seriously, that's just, um, that's just fantastic. I, Congratulations. I, I seriously tell this story to my friends, and they're like, "Oh my god." This is crazy. I look back at it. I, this guy's kind of like initiated this idea that, hey, yeah, I love games. I, I I make music. Why not combine this together? And here we are. So have you ever had this similar experience where you get to meet a hero in your career and get some tips from him or her? I've, I've gotten to meet a lot of folks that I look up to and admire. Um, but they've been either one of two situations. It's the fanboy situation, like where I got to meet John Williams. Wow. Just me and him and my friend Alan. And it was more of a gracious appreciation than like, so when you're thinking about like the harmony for a major seven and you're orchestrating <laughs> it in the woodwinds, 
I was too, honestly, too breathless and like just sort of out of my mind with excitement when I met him. Um, the other, the other end of the spectrum is meeting people that I love and really appreciate, but they're closer to my age and I meet them in a work environment. Um, other composers that I get to collaborate with on scores or, um, film composers that maybe I'm doing the game score for. So we get to talk about that. But again, it's not as much of the nitty gritty technical stuff. It's more like, okay, overall kinds of conversations, yeah. like, you know, very, very general paintbrush strokes of like the way something would sound or... Um, I worked, w I talked with Harry Gregson Williams when I was doing a video game and he was doing the film and it was about like his inspiration of, you know, like British composers from the early 1900s. So not really the technical kinds of things. Um, but I think it's the same end result. Like I leave those conversations or especially the in-person meetings, like feeling just incredibly like nostalgic, but also like charged to do something on my own because you realize that these people whose music you've been disseminating like in your brain and listening to and you associate with all these either gameplay or movie events or parts of your life are just, they're people like everybody else probably living a fairly normal life other than the fact that they work in the studio or get to conduct it, you know, orchestras at, at, Sony Studios or anything like that. And um, it's great because it sort of makes you feel like anything's possible, which is what I try and sort of re-articulate um, when fantastic people such as yourself reach out and, you know, ask for an opinion or listening to a track or, or something like that. Um, I think if I were younger, I would be doing the same thing. But when I was younger, that was not available. The social media, the internet, none of that was around. I mean, you could maybe write a letter, <laughs> right, to somebody, but you would never really get a response. So I think it's fantastic. Um, I love it. And I love just being a tiny, tiny part of reciprocating that sort of thing that some of those people have done for me in my career. Yeah, it's so inspiring. I mean, you You actually took the time whenever I sent you something and just listened to it and you came back. I, and, and trust me, that Dungeon Siege remix was shit. <laughs> like, I was like, a, <laughs> I, I don't even know. I don't even have it. I don't even remember anything from it. But, but it was back when I just started doing this stuff. And probably it's just a teenage boy from sending this. Not a teenager. Sending you uh, something, and you took the time and listened to it. And I remember you explained some stuff from it as well, and you just said, "Keep, keep, keep up the great work." And for some reason, that stayed in my, my head. And whenever some people come come to me for advice or something, s sending me tracks, I kind of like, "Hey, hey be be the Jason Graves for them." <laughs> 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 yeah, I love that. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's. I just think it's really cool that um, we all have access to the same tools and a lot of it is the personal journey that you are and where you are and sort of like your musical tastes and how you're learning to kind of put combinations of things together. And it's like there is no right or wrong way to do it and a lot of times it's what inspires you personally and I try to I try to listen to things through that lens Um if someone's sending me something, because of course it's not exactly the way that I would do it, but that's because they're not me and we have completely different life paths and or maybe into different kinds of music and have access to slightly different tools, but there's no reason for positivity to not exist. Yeah. Even if it's like, hey, here's some things that maybe could be tweaked, but here's some stuff that I really love because that's what I would want to hear. Just like, I'm trying to be the John Williams. Um, he had so many compliments for me, even though he had no idea who I was and had never heard any of my music. Everything that I said, he came back with this glorious comment and like remembered my name. I talked to him for probably 15 minutes, kept calling me Jason, and, like asking if I could, was anything for him to sign and just, just the epitome of a gentleman. So for me, if I can do 1% of that, then... Um, achievement unlocked. Yeah, <laughs> you did it. So I mentioned Dead Space coming out 15 years ago. I'm not saying this. Uh, yeah. By the way, you always look young. <laughs> I'm 
even accept I don't accept the hair. Yeah, it's 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 even sexier, man. But yeah. uh, I was telling my friend today about this. Look at this guy. He never gets old. So I mentioned uh, Dead Space 15 years ago. Wow. Not saying this because I'm talking to you now, but I really believe this is the best horror score for a game. It's classical, but it's also very fresh, industrial, and dynamic. It's a music that makes you curious about what comes next. And what comes next is nothing but nightmare. <laughs> so when you look back <laughs> at it now, what's the most important thing that comes to your mind? Um, well, when, when anyone says Dead Space, the first thing that comes to mind, it may not be the most important, or it may, is complete and utter, or I should say is failure, fa I'm sorry, let me rephrase, is the fear of complete and utter failure. That was <laughs> my general mental state during most of that game, only because the audio director gave me complete freedom to do whatever I wanted. And the only way I was going to be proven wrong was if the game came out and, you know, didn't do well or they said, like, the graphics are amazing, but the musical score, like, gives away too much or doesn't do enough or... It was a very... Not a new sound in the world of classical music because I wasn't doing any anything new in the general world of music, but it hadn't really been done in games before. And... I felt like it would work, but through that fear of failure, which I think we all have and I still have, including this morning, exporting stems, um, it, it drove me to do more and in this case to write scarier music. So over like the nine months I was writing it, by the time I was four months in, I was like, nothing I did before was even scary. I have to make this scarier. So I kept coming up with new ways to like make the music even more shocking and even scarier. And I think that it actually ended up working. Um, you know, you can hear, <laughs> I hear at least, my my fear and like isolation and insecurity <laughs> through all that music because it's just so over the top, like crazy over the top. <laughs> And I thought that it would be a very unrecognized score because it was so noisy and clangy and not very melodic. And it turns out all the things that I thought people would be turned off by, all the horror people just loved, which is awesome. I love that. Yeah, it's outrageous. So how did they come to you for this project? Was, this, was, was there a particular score that you've done before that that got their attention or something? I had never written any horror music before Dead Space. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's not true. I did one cue in school at USC with Christopher Young. I did a horror cue for him with that. And um, he sort of took me under his wing. This was like in 96. And like gave me a couple of his personal conductor scores. And I did some work for him when I got out of school. And he's known for horror, but also some other beautiful scores. And Dead Space was sort of me dusting off that hat after just one cue with Chris Young and trying some new things. It was a general kind of call for composers. They actually, they wanted to hire Chris for the game. But, you know, this was in 2006, I think. And film composers just weren't doing that back <laughs> then. And I think he was too busy, thank goodness, so they were doing a general call and I did a couple of specific demos just based on what they said they were looking for. And within about a week, the audio director sent an email and my agent said he wanted my phone number and he called up and was just like, we want exactly what you're doing. Like that, no one else has done it like this. This is what I wanted the score to sound like, which actually isn't the final score, but that's a whole other 30 minute conversation. At the time, I did what they were looking for. I, I, like, ticked the boxes of their requirements, and that's how I got the gig. Yeah, so looking back at your career, it's filled with amazing horror projects. From, from a psychological perspective, what do you see inside of yourself that conjures such horror and tension? <laughs> You're like the sweetest composer on earth, yet this, the music you make is pure <laughs> nightmare. And the irony of it is your love of birds and their sounds. <laughs> Yes, I have a parrot who is in the other room right now because she would be squawking and completely um, <laughs> yeah. taking away my attention. Um, I think I think part of it is the fact that 
my main instrument is like percussion or drums. So even if I'm writing like a what could be considered like a beautiful or mournful sort of string quartet piece or something, um, I'm still sort of thinking about it in terms of rhythm. And the final sound that you hear in Dead Space was basically me thinking, well, what's the sc- how can I make music sound the scariest way possible? Well, what makes music not scary? It, it means it's familiar. So you've got a melody. Okay, I'm not going to use a melody. You have like a constant like eight or four bar phrase of four, four or three, four, some sort of a regular pattern to the music. Okay, I'm going to throw that out. And then you have harmony that is pleasant and and soothing or not, like tension and release. Okay, I'm just going to throw out the harmony. Well, if there's no harmony and there's no like kind of normal rhythm and there's no melody, all that's left is just bass, like caveman rhythms. And what I did intentionally was occasionally there's some 4-4, four, four, but mostly it's just crazy time signatures everywhere that don't repeat and throw the listener or the player constantly off guard as to where the downbeat's going to be or where that next French horn really um, disturbing, like, trill is going to come in. You're expecting it to come in now, but nope, it comes in a little early or it comes in later. Um, anything that would be comforting, I disassociated myself with and kind of put the orchestra together as I would um, a drum set, just playing the most messed up beats you've ever heard. Yeah, and th- it's interesting because uh, the other day I was talking to Tina Guo and we talked about uh, how we kind of like express our emotions uh, through music and uh, kind of maybe uh, uh, heal some uh, memories through music. Do you see yourself uh, do such thing uh, uh, with the music you make? Maybe not all of them, but do you see yourself heal or just uh, emotionally uh, expressed when you're working on such a particular score? Absolutely. I mean, any any score. Um, what what I love about my job is. I I come from a film and a little bit of TV background from when I was younger, but I definitely come from a film score appreciation, like nerd kind of background. So all those 80s and 90s and early 2000s soundtracks when I was kind of in my formative years of composition, and I know a lot of them like the back of my hand, and I would make cassette tapes while I'm mowing the lawn, and there'd be James Horner and Jerry Goldsmith and John Williams... James Newton Howard, like all these scores that were telling a story, even though I'm cutting the grass, right? I'm blissfully transported to wherever, you know, whether it's a Willow score or um, Raiders of the Lost Ark or whatever. Um, The music's telling a story. And I try to do that um, in my own way with whatever I'm working on um, to emotionally connect with it, which if you're doing something like Dead Space, means that you're essentially like emotionally and physically exhausted at the end of the day because I'm really like mentally leaning into what I'm doing and I'm I'm expecting this like visceral response when I play the music back. And if I don't get it, I work on it some more. Um, and on the other hand, if I'm doing something like Moss, then it's like the most relaxing, beautiful sort of process during the day because I'm getting to do what I really love, which is melodies and kind of jazzy harmonies and like wistful orchestration. But I wouldn't want to do that all day long. Like one makes the other more interesting, which is great because I'm literally doing both um, in multiple versions uh, currently. But if it doesn't have an emotional like reaction to me, like in my soul when I'm listening to it, it, I don't think it's going to be good enough. And I keep tweaking it until it does. And it's interesting because uh, each project has this limitation, this rules that you should not come uh, go beyond. Like, for example, Dead Space can't be something uh, like emotional, at least emotional like Moss, for example. And uh, yeah. you were recently worked on uh, Call of Duty uh, Warzone. And that right. world, and I was actually thinking about that. And... and um, 
I had, uh, and I need to decide, uh, the other composer of Call of Duty, Call of Duty Warzone uh, uh, on the podcast as well. And I'm, I, I was thinking about uh, this, that um, this is a multiplayer game and it's heavily relied on sound, but how much uh, can you g- go there and uh, these limitations, do they kind of like hold you back from what you have in mind or uh, what you can express fully or you uh, kind of find it interesting, just uh, find your voice uh, within these boundaries? A lot of times, <clears throat> I feel like most people would say this, but a lot of times for me, boundaries and restrictions are what breed creativity. Um, which is why a lot of times I, most of the time actually, okay, all of the time I give myself creative boundaries or restrictions on on any job that I'm doing, especially games, because they're so unique in and to in and unto themselves like the world of moss is completely different from modern warfare 2 which is completely different from dead space so i feel like the music should be saying that as well even if it's just playing a single note and this goes back to the emotional response of music the texture of something the timbre of something um i do a lot better if i'm panicking because i've I'm convinced that I've given myself too many instrumental like restrictions. What was I thinking? How could I write combat music just with violas, cellos, and basses and a bunch of low woodwinds? That was That's order. my score for the order. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So many times I was trying to write this combat music and it's like, okay, and then I'm going to have the French horn. Oh, there are no French horns. Well, then I'm going to have the, vi- there are no violins. Well, what's going to play the melody? I've only got like so many voices. And that's what, when I'm backed in a corner creatively, that's kind of where the uh, inspiration hopefully strikes, even if not immediately, maybe like the next day. Oh, well, I could try this instead. And I think my greatest fear is just repeating myself. Um, like not not meaning like using the same melody, but like a horror score comes out and it's like, well, yeah, so Jason Graves did this and obviously it sounds just like Dead Space. I would never would never want that to happen. Um, so I limit myself creatively. And with something like um, Modern Warfare or Warzone, um, that's a testament to uh, Jonathan Mayer and the people that he has at Spider Farm uh, Productions, which is his like music house. Um, he did all of Modern Warfare 2 that came out last year, all of the Warzone stuff. Uh, he and his company implement and, and mix all of the music that goes into the game. So Jonathan's the one, or Nicole actually deals with a lot of my stems. They're responsible for taking my six minute suite of 80 stems of like a completely full track and breaking that down into like 20 or 30 minutes of in-game music um, that like plays in the menus um, and plays at the start of a mission or plays near the end of a mission. They're basically creating new scores from all of these stems that I have with these amazing musicians that have recorded things for me. And that's the second half of the work. So I'm limiting myself, but I'm also really relying on folks like Jonathan to implement things properly and like to be another creative mind to kind of do things that maybe I wouldn't have even considered. I've I've heard on YouTube, if you Google like any Warzone menu for Warzone 2.0, most of those are my cues because that's sort of what I was brought on for. But I'll hear things where I'm like, oh, this isn't mine. And then about 30 seconds in, I'll recognize but it is something. Yours. <laughs> I'm like, oh, wait, that is. Yeah. Oh, but that's the, oh. And, and they're not moving things around. They're just doing alternate mixes and, you know, maybe scooting a, a big blow boom to start something off. And it's like a rearrangement, but in the best way possible. Yeah, and and uh, what's great about it is, as you've mentioned, that these limitations that you put yourself uh, put on yourself makes uh, uh, each project unique. I mean, th- you're not just repeating uh, Dead Space. I mean, your your uh, cons- uh, your work with super massive games, for example, Dark uh, Pictures Anthology, and they're mm-hmm. completely different. <laughs> great just that, like hey hey yeah we love that space uh we would like to hire you as a composer yeah but well, it's gonna be like 100 different than the other so that 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 is great so um 
it means that you really know your uh, uh, craft. So I think it's a g good time to ask this, that the other composers listening to this uh, podcast going to grab a pen to write whatever secret comes out of you next. What are some secret sauces for making great horror music? It's not luck. You um, know it, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I... <clears throat> It's it's hard. It's <laughs> I appreciate you being generous. Um, it if if especially if there's other other composers um, listening. I don't know if this is good news or bad news, but I have a feeling we're all the same. I don't think anyone ever, if they're really looking for the right kind of creative outlets and trying new things all the time and trying to sort of do something they haven't done before. Um, you're never going to sit back and go like, yeah, I've, I've got this figured out. Like I know all the <laughs> tips and tricks to like do horror music, for example. Um, if not anything else, it's sort of like, oh my gosh. So by the end of that dead space game, I kind of figured out some cool tips and tricks and like shortcuts that I knew would work, but I can't use those on this next game because I want this game to sound different. And then you get back into panic mode. Oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm doing. How am I going to figure out how to, and then you're about halfway through that game and you're like, oh, I've got this figured out. And then the game's over and you're like, but I don't want to do that on the next one. Or like my current situation multiple scary things happening at the same time. And I've got to keep them as diversified as possible because I don't want two games to come out within a month of each other and have both of my scores sound the same. Um, I, I only mention all this because I think as a composer, we all feel insecure and we all feel, you know, um, imposter syndrome. And I think that's a good thing to an extent because it makes us try to be better. Um, I wish that I didn't feel that way from a mental standpoint, but I try to keep it at bay. And um, I think it's a universal feeling. However, all of that being said, if you're talking about horror music in general, for me, it goes back to that initial reaction of Dead Space. Um, whatever isn't familiar is scary. And I just keep trying to find new ways of doing that. What can I do that isn't familiar? And usually that means, um, you know, not pulling up a Native Instruments app and flicking through some presets. It means having a microphone. I've recorded stuff with my iPhone when I do have plenty of mics around here. I just like the way the iPhone sounded. I was like bowing a spring on a mic stand and I used my microphone as a quick test and that ended up sounding cooler than when I put like an expensive tube mic against it just because of the way it sounded. I think a live performance of a texture, a sound, not even something melodic, especially when you're bowing or hitting something. Now, again, I'm a drummer and percussionist, so this is where I'm coming from. But that sort of thing speaks volumes and sounds 10,000 times scarier because no one knows what it is because you're the only one that's come up with it. Um, unfamiliarity breeds horror. Um, Non-musical, um, you know, having something that maybe is a creepy sound, but you play a major chord with it, but it's like really out of tune. So it's kind of major, but kind of weird. And your brain's just like, no, that's not right. <laughs> that's what I'm always trying to do. And the beauty of this job is I'm not doing it in a vacuum. I'm not sitting around looking up at the sky going, what can I do that sounds scary? <laughs> As a game composer or a film composer or a TV composer, we're inspired by the worlds that we are sort of living in and the music that we are creating for them, for me, is born out of all the specifics of that world. Um, I wish I could talk more about some of the things I'm doing now because it is super fun to be able to do them. And I'm trying to think back. Um, little Hope for uh, Supermassive Games. Um, it's years old, so I can give a couple of spoilers. It takes place in a couple of different times, and one of them is like the late 1600s. And there's a girl who's sort of this ghost. And immediately I was like, my daughter is 12. She can sing. I'm going to have her do the main theme, and it's going to sound really creepy. Because what's scarier than a little girl like singing a creepy melody? Um, that was the beginning of it, but the rest of it was basically like, well, what would it sound like in the late 1600s if there were a pub band, quote unquote, in this town in the late 1600s? They'd be playing like some super out of tune piano and like maybe a bowed psaltery or a hammered dulcimer or like all these 
kind of raw and not quite properly tuned kinds of instruments. And that's what I built that score around. And many times I was convinced that I'd painted myself into a corner and I was running out of options. But just silly things like having my daughter go, like make funny ghost sounds. I threw that into contact, put, wow. put a bunch of reverb on it, dropped it down like four octaves, and wow. all of a sudden it sounded like a Gregorian choir. <laughs> and I wouldn't have done all that if I wasn't trying to sort of creatively shoehorn in that little girl as the kind of main antagonist uh, that the characters in the game see. Um, that's always my inspiration, like from beginning to end, is the gameplay. And that's why, hopefully, you'll listen to other Dark Pictures games, and they all... They all sound really different because it's like a completely different sonic palette for each one because it's a completely different world for each game. I'm going to stop talking now and you can ask another question. <laughs> <laughs> it was unbelievably great answer. I mean, th this couldn't be better than this. Like, okay, the greatest fear that we have is fear of unknown. So why not creating the unknown in your music? And that's it. That's the key. And... Everyone can. Now, everyone can See, make it. <laughs> I could have answered it so much better in like five words like that than my like five minute pontification. <laughs> Let's talk about jump scares. What makes a good jump scare and how music can evolve it? I mean, I mean, I mean. Let's talk about jump scares in general, like not just musically, but of course, we talk about music. But what do you think makes a jump scare work? I'm sure there's a book about this out there. If not, it's a great idea. Probably. Um, I remember the last time I really jumped in a theater, and this is showing my age a little bit because I don't go to the <laughs> movies as much as I used to, but I saw The Ring, the original wow. Ring in the theater, and I think that was that was Hans Zimmer. And yeah. um, there was a jump scare, like something in a closet or something, but I don't even think that Zimmer did the jump scare. It was just white noise. It was just like, Tsh. yeah, but it was so sonically encompassing, like the highs and the lows and everything in the theater was like one of the scariest things that I had heard. And of course it was prefaced with like the music turning off for like the next, the first 30 seconds before the jump scare. And then it got real quiet in the film and there were no sound effects and the buildup to the boo as Don Vecca, the audio director on the first Dead Space, um, called it the build up to the boo is actually more important than the the jump scare itself um and his requirement of me for tension cues which was one of the, kind of the three types of cues we wrote for dead space was he wanted the tension cues to feel so tense that by the time you got to the end of this hallway and the cue was sort of getting louder and building up and these are his words not mine a fluffy white bunny rabbit could hop out behind the other, like the corner of the corridor, and you would still scream, throw the remote control across the room and like run out of the room because the the buildup had been done like so well. And that was something that really kind of resonated with me and, and I keep trying to do, especially with games because you can implement things so many different ways. So yeah, a sudden sound, yes, but I mean, you could have a jump scare with no music whatsoever. The visuals are what are scaring you. But the only reason the visuals are scaring you is because the audio prepped you. The audio put you on the edge of your seat, like in suspenseful anticipation, thinking that something was going to happen. So um, this next question is interesting. Do you believe in ghosts? And tell me a personal scary experience you had in your life. Personal scary experience. Hmm. Oh, I know, I know a really good one, actually. Um, we, we, we're in a house uh, right now. We moved here seven years ago. It's on about 30 acres of property. So we're out in the middle of nowhere. And the very first night we were here, I think all of us were super excited, but also a little, like, uncomfortable because it was completely pitch black outside. And, like, I mean, no street lights, right? We're, we're surrounded by woods. We love it now. But at the time, it was a little unsettling because it was our first night. And... I was upstairs in where I'm sitting now, what was this, what was the studio at the time, but it had windows. 
And I was just turning off the lights and kind of closing up the doors and was getting ready to go to bed. And there was this tap, 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 really loud on the window, like on the glass pane of the window. And I forgot to mention, I'm on the second floor of our house. And there's no, the windows um, are such that they're protruding from the roof. So you can't really like stand in front of the window like you could on a normal, it, it, it scared me to death because it was quiet. And it was right next to my head. And I literally ran out of the room and kind of went downstairs with like my heart in my chest. And we kept our deck door open. And I was panicking, thinking that (laughs) someone was doing something. And everybody else was in bed. It's like 1130 at night. And there was never any real solution as to what that noise was. But we did find out like the following year that this time of year, which is when we moved in, there's there's a family of uh, woodpeckers that come around. And our house had actually been empty for about six months. And that was the first night we had lights on at night. And we're pretty sure that the woodpecker came up and was tapping on the glass because he was like, what the heck is this? Because normally it's dark. It's completely dark. There's no lights on. And I've, because I heard him on the tree like a year later, I heard this. And I was like, wow, that reminds me of what I heard a year ago on my window. And I looked up and there was a woodpecker on the tree. So it was just the woodpecker. But oh my God. Gosh, I mean, I think I slept like two hours that night. It was, yeah, it, it completely got me. It sounded like someone with a hammer, like lightly tapping on the glass oh just to not God. break it. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> it happens when you work on too many games for Dark Picture Anthology. So uh, how did this right? project happen? How, how did this, uh, I mean, it began with uh, Until Dawn and then this, it was so, such a successful project that it, kind of expanded to this huge franchise. Every year uh, there is this one one game coming out. That's impressive, actually. Yep. So how did this happen? I know. Well, I think Supermassive um, really put in their homework on Until Dawn. I know the the audio team at the time was, was literally like a team of one. It was Barney yeah. Pratt <laughs> and myself. And I worked with Barney for almost two years on that score, and then it wow. ended, ended up getting pushed, if I remember correctly, from the PS3 to the PS4. Wow. So they had an extra year and a half to work on the development of the game, but the music was all finished. And Barney spent that year and a half, of course, doing sound effects and voiceover, but also kind of spinning my two and a half hour score out into about a 12 hour music experience all by himself. In Pro Tools, like wow. repitching things and combining things and doing alternate mixes and all the stuff that we talked about in theory if he needed more time. I think the whole Supermassive team did that for the game. And it was so um, well-received and and well-respected, both in terms of a horror game, but also just in the the replayability of it, that they just doubled down and said, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to go deeper with each title. So the titles are going to be shorter in and of themselves, but they're going to be even deeper in terms of replayability. And on top of that, we're going to do an anthology and release one game every year, which a lot of people, even at Supermassive, sort of raise their eyes, like, we're going to do what? <laughs> <laughs> but they, um, they have a couple of different internal teams that sort of ping pong titles and things. So it's not like one game is getting made from beginning to end by all the same people in one year. And as they build the games, there are like structural assets and things that are proprietary to their company that they can they can reuse. So they're not having to like, what's a sidewalk look like in a game? You know, they can yeah. they can repurpose things. I think it's brilliant because I'm not that much of a horror game player, but my my <laughs> youngest daughter and I love playing the dark pictures because yeah. we'll play it like three times. Wow and do different things. And it's like three completely different games. It's fantastic. Wow. Yeah. I think you're the only person that is kind of like working on all of this project, <laughs> right? Yeah. I think as far as the Dark Pictures anthology goes, um, that's me. I know they recently had another game that came out, a different part of their studio. They just they just keep growing. Yeah. I'm just happy that they're wow. so successful. Um, multiple games running like parallel with each other. So yeah, they would need a different composer because I mean, until I can clone myself, (laughs) I'm going to focus on just the dark pictures. Yeah. Great. So now here we go to the favorites. Jason Graves, what are some of your favorite horror scores for movies? Alien, Jerry Goldsmith, Poltergeist, Jerry Goldsmith, (laughs) 
Close Encounters of the Third Kind, John Williams. Um, Exorcism of Emily Rose, Christopher Young. Those are all fantastic. So uh, what are favorite horror films, just for the sake of the film? Psycho, because of the psychological suspense. Um, Alien. (laughs) Oh, uh, um, The Shining is probably my favorite. Wow. Which is not original scored, but Kubrick does that. Um, But I just think it was so masterfully masterfully put together, and um, Jack Nicholson's performance was just, oh my gosh. And that's how I was introduced to um, Penderecki, who's a Polish composer that writes classical music, but all the scary stuff you hear in Kubrick films is him. And if you listen to that, you'd go, sounds like Dead Space, because I just inhaled all of his scores and regurgitated them in video game format. Yeah, and that score was so unique that it follows exactly what you said, the fear of unknown. Uh, yeah, so uh, um, some, what are some of your favorite video game soundtracks? Uh, the first Medal of Honor soundtrack still leaves a mark for me because that's what I heard. That's Michael Giacchino before I was into video games. And it really made me, made me raise my eyebrows and say, this is video game music because it was orchestral and like beautiful and reminded me of something like from Saving Private Ryan. A friend of mine played that for me and I was kind of like, maybe I should uh, look into this video game music. (laughs) Um, uh, Bioshock by Gary Scheiman, I think was just like masterful and it, it came out and won all the awards a year before Dead Space came out. And I was actually in the middle of working on Dead Space and Bioshock came out and I was like, oh my gosh, gosh darn it, Gary, you're like completely beating me to the punch. And I I introduced myself to him like at the award. He had like a handful of awards and I was like, oh, Mr. Shyman, I'm I'm doing a video game to horror score too. And, it's, and he's like, oh, I'm sure it's going to be great. And since then we've become very close and are, are great friends. And Gary's just a, a genius and a masterful composer. I love everything that he writes. Um... I'm trying to think what else pokes out. Uh, Journey, Austin Wintory's score for Journey, which everybody knows, but just so lyrical and beautiful. That's Tina playing cello, and uh, the way it was implemented was just pure genius. I had the pleasure of working with Austin on a couple of games, and um, I had him at my house and studio for like a week, and he sat down with my kids who like, just fawned over him like a rock star. And I'm sitting there like, you know, I do the same thing he does and I've been doing it longer. And they're just like, oh, Austin, Austin. But he sat down with them and played Journey beginning to end in like a two hour speed run and showed them like all the secrets and all the tricks. Uh, And again, I'm very good friends with Austin who is another amazing composer um, and a a great person. Um, Everyone's gone to the rapture, Jessica Curry. Yeah. So there's going to be a, there's going to be a theme here. I'm also very good friends with Jess, and I think she's amazing yeah. <laughs> and a really great composer. So it's like the people that um, I've grown to know personally. It started out as fanboyism, and then it grew into like a wonderful relationship as as friends and fellow composers who can like share and commiserate. Um, but I also think there's a creative, like a creative yearning and like dissatisfaction for repeating what you've done that we kind of all share in our personalities as well as in our music. Yeah. This is great. So Jason Graves, thank you. We got to wrap this up now. Thank you so much, Jason. You're such an incredible human being on top of being one of the best composers in the history of video games. Often next time we'll meet each other, we'll be in person and I get to buy you a drink. Oh, absolutely. I'll <laughs> buy you a drink for congratulations to all of uh, all of your life exploitations and, you know, weathering and enduring the ups and downs of being a composer. Um, yeah. It's great to hear about positivity. Um, but of course, knowing that there's like valleys in between all of those like peaks of happiness and success and I'm just thrilled that you're you're still here and you're still working and we were able to have this conversation this is beautiful thank you so much sir hope to see you soon my pleasure thank you yeah